Well, good evening. What a wonderful thing to gather in this, our 150th year, to celebrate 50 years uh, that was experienced by one man uh, here at the college. It's, it's, uh, it's wow. And, and to have such a wonderful group uh, come together this evening. We have a former SGA president, Simone, that's here. We've got a couple of, hey, we've got a, I'm going to call you out now. She's really shy. We've got uh, some trustees here. Uh, if you'll raise your hand if you're a trustee. We've got Brenda and Sarah there. We've got uh, many uh, of Bill Rutherford's um, colleagues in the faculty who uh, deeply respect him as a person and as a uh, teacher. I know this. Uh, if you'll raise your hand if you're one of our faculty. Um, yes, and then we've got uh, administration here. Um, the provost, the COO, our uh, vice president for finance, assistant vice president, our associate vice president for finance, and, and just many others who uh, are here out of their deep respect for this institution, but also for this man. And then uh, a lot of community folks, because this man was not only uh, a part of this college, he was really a part of the entire community. And so what a joy it is to have him share in this, our 150th year. Uh, in those 150th year, I'm a really Johnny come lately. I mean, I, whoo, I'm this, I'm going on two and a half uh, uh, years. And uh, so it's a particular uh, joy for me tonight. You know, uh, we benefit from new folks uh, uh, coming into our town or into our institutions. Uh, they bring fresh energy and new ideas. But we really um, have uh, been able to accomplish sustainability and stability because of those who have come and made this their opus, their life's work. And uh, here to uh, introduce that one and also to let you know about a few other events that are coming up in the next several days that I think you'll really benefit from. Um, you know, legend is not a, a term that I use lightly to describe uh, Bill Rutherford. Um, but a legend is something uh, literally that means uh, this should be read. Well, this man's life should be read. And our history professor uh, will introduce this historical legend, uh, Ken Vickers. All right. Uh, before we get to the start of the evening, just some announcements this week and the next month, really. Uh, are kind of jam-packed, so I ask you to keep an eye on social media and if you're on the Martin email uh, lists uh, for upcoming events. Just for the rest of this week alone, on January 23rd, uh, thir Thursday night, uh, we have Dr. Greg Hill, who's the dean of the Perkins Divinity School at Southern Methodist University. Uh, he's going to speak here in the Galt Center at 7. Um, on a special lecture over status, ambition, and the way of Jesus. One of those things didn't go with the first two, so I'll be curious what he has to say about that. On Friday night, uh, January 24th, here in the Galt Center, our own Dr. Brendan Jacklin and guest pianist Dr. Leonidas Lagrimus will present the Four Hands Piano Concert. Uh, and on a slightly grimmer note, <laughs> Next Tuesday night, uh, January 28th, 7, here in the Galt, uh, the Criminal Justice Department is going to give a presentation on human trafficking. Uh, unfortunately, a, a very timely uh, event. But um, in keeping with the sesquicentennial, keep your eyes out uh, next month 
for African American History Month. Um, we're going to have three presentations of the play Boycott, which deals with Pulaski's unique role in, shall we say, turning its back on its history. Uh, we will have also in February a civil rights panel um, and a kind of return presentation from Miss Alina Brown Prince, who was the first African American student uh, at Martin, as well as a broader general civil rights roundtable. And in March, on March 4th, um, we're going to have a special day for the women of the college, uh, bring back um, and graduates of the institution. So these are just a few of the many uh, events that are coming up, so please do keep an eye out. And for students, I have the QR code. Uh, see me after the presentation. Now, it is my pleasure tonight to introduce William E. Rutherford, or W-E-R, if you've ever received an email. Uh, from him. Um, Bill is a native of Waco, Texas, who earned his Bachelor's of Science degree at Middle Tennessee State uh, in Murfreesboro in 1966, and his Master's degree at Howard Payne University in Brownwood, Texas in 1971. He has completed additional study at Indiana University, Mississippi State, uh, excuse me, I did that, Middle Tennessee State <laughs> University, and at Colorado State. University. I think I would have stayed at Colorado State, but um, Mr. Rutherford also is a member of the Oxford Roundtable at Oxford University, England, having completed the requisite residence requirements in the area of sustainability in the environment, an area that's near and dear uh, to his interests. Now, Mr. Rutherford began his career at then Martin College. He's been here a while. Um, <laughs> I was asked to do the presentation on 150 years of Martin's history. Uh, Mr. Rutherford's lived a third <laughs> of that. Uh, so I guess it will explain to me everything I got wrong uh, tonight over the last 50 years. Uh, but he began his career at Martin College in 1971 as assistant professor, lowly assistant professor of history. Um, and trust me. We're lowly. Um, through the years, he's held a variety of positions here, uh, working his way up to associate and full professor. Uh, but he has been vice president and dean of admissions, chair of the social science division, the founding director of the W. Gary Taylor Honors Program. He was active in the creation and curricular development of the behavioral sciences program, criminal justice program, and history program here on campus. He has served students as a coordinator of the Irish American Scholars Program in the annual Tennessee Intercollegiate State Legislature Convention. Does everybody remember the great victory there? <coughs> we beat Vanderbilt. <laughs> okay. Mr. Rutherford was the coordinator of that. He has led international study tours in England, Scotland, Ireland, France, Germany, Austria, Italy, Spain, Portugal, Morocco, Sweden, Mexico, New York City, and Washington, D.C. So as you see in the last 50 years, he really hadn't done a whole lot. Uh, <laughs> considering. Um, this is just a brief listing of his service to the college on his Vita. Uh, we can't discuss it all because he has to talk some uh, himself. But mentioning the fact that he's held a number of positions on campus, uh, high-ranking positions on campus, uh, so he's probably mowed the yard more than once. Uh, and I don't know, may, may or may not have cleaned the occasional facility. Uh, but Following the completion of his master's gardener program uh, certificate, he serves as a campus volunteer on a part-time basis um, at Martin now. Um, Bill is married to Elizabeth Blackburn Rutherford, uh, and they have two children and two grandchildren. 
for some reason spend an inordinate amount of time in Texas. I don't know. I don't know why that would be. Uh, he is a member of First Presbyterian Church Pulaski, where he serves as an elder and, the, and as a member of the choir. And without further ado, I present to you William E. Rutherford. Thank you, Ken. I appreciate that. Uh, and now I don't have to speak nearly as long as, uh, as I had planned on uh, doing. You're very kind. Um, and I appreciate all of you uh, being here uh, this evening as well. Uh, my presentation may seem like it will last for 50 years, uh, but I, I promise I'll have you out of here in just over 30 minutes. Uh, I heard a preacher say recently that he follows the 5B rule, uh, but listen to the 5B rule uh, concerning the length of his sermons. That is, be brief, brother, be brief. Uh, uh, my, my program this evening is uh, the third in the series of sesquicentennial faculty programs, uh, which began with an evening with friends uh, back April uh, 2019, including Johnny Jackson, Gail Newton, uh, and Steve West, uh, with others. September uh, 2019 marked the presentation by uh, Dr. Vickers uh, on the challenges uh, and the successes of the college uh, since its inception uh, in 1870. Uh, other faculty programs uh, will follow over the next year. Uh, Dr. Cheatham, I might I might uh, draw this to your attention at this point in time. Dominic Negrelli, the professor of religion here, told me when he learned I was going to be speaking tonight that if I would mention his name, or every time I mentioned his name, he would give the college $50. So, uh, <clears throat> so Dominic, uh, <clears throat> I hope you're listening and have your checkbook handy. Uh, I think perhaps you may owe the college oh, roughly $1,000 or something <laughs> like that by the time I get through uh, mentioning his name, his name, I mean Dominic, uh, <clears throat> repeatedly. You'll probably get sick and tired of hearing his name. I'm very pleased to introduce uh, my wife uh, Beth uh, to you as uh, Ken had uh, introduced her uh, to you this evening. We have been married for almost 53 years and uh, have uh, two sons, Patrick and Ted, and uh, one daughter-in-law, Holly, and two grandchildren, uh, Cameron and uh, Jacob. And Beth has been my uh, go-to person uh, through all that uh, life presents. Uh, I tend to be impulsive in my decision-making, and she could be described as steady as she goes. <laughs> and uh, we make a good team. Uh, I love you, Sherry Bear. <laughs> Martin has been a large part of her life, uh, too, as she uh, grew up uh, in Colonial Hall, uh, which uh, was her, uh, her family home. When I began teaching here, she got involved in a very active group uh, called uh, the Martin Ladies Club. And uh, they hosted monthly uh, covered dish uh, dinners, compiled two cookbooks, uh, assisted countless students uh, with food needs and clothing, and by the early 1980s, things got, shall we say, complicated, and the Martin Ladies Club stopped meeting. And uh, I wish it could be revived uh, with a 21st century twist. I have a door prize uh, for uh, one of you this evening. Uh, if you are from Cornersville, Tennessee, but currently reside in Tulsa, Oklahoma, <laughs> please raise your hand. Oh. I think we have a winner, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> uh, now, I lost my place. Um, hold on just a second. I didn't, uh, um, oh, yeah, here we go. Um, so, uh, <laughs> 
it, uh, this is, of course, our good friend Mary Moore, uh, who has journeyed here this evening uh, from, from Tulsa, literally this evening. She flew in today, and she flies out first thing in the morning, uh, going back, uh, back to Tulsa, and uh, where she's a librarian. She was a librarian at Pulaski Elementary here and years ago when we got to, first got to know her. And Beth and I have been fortunate enough to travel with Mary uh, over the years. Mary, thank you very, very much for uh, being with us tonight. Martin Methodist College uh, means a, a lot to, to all of us, and in many ways uh, we're very much like uh, Mr. Rogers' neighborhood. And we're small, caring, diverse, and uh, interdependent. And um, Martin has become a fiber then in the lives of all who touch it. And in one way or another, the college is a part of our, our very being. And uh, I'm glad to be a part of the neighborhood and I know you are as well. My first encounter with Martin was in 1963 when uh, my parents moved uh, to uh, Pulaski uh, from Texas. And my father built and owned uh, cable television systems in Lawrenceburg and Pulaski and Fayetteville. And uh, we lived in the middle uh, here in Pulaski. I graduated from uh, high school in 1962 and began my first uh, year of college uh, there at uh, Howard Payne uh, University in, in Brownwood, Texas. It is a very small private institution that I, I felt very much, very much at home there. Uh, I'm not for sure why I felt the need uh, to move to Tennessee uh, with my parents, but I soon found out moving here uh, was a, a very good choice, uh, as I soon met Beth. And uh, I have more on that story in a minute. <laughs> Uh, I needed to decide uh, first, you know, where to transfer, if I'm going to transfer from Texas College uh, here. Uh, Martin was the obvious choice, except for the fact that Martin was still a two-year institution at that point in time. And I would have to transfer, excuse me, yeah, transfer again after my sophomore year, so that didn't make uh, good sense. I uh, ended up uh, at MPSU and completed my undergraduate uh, degree there uh, in uh, 1966. Coincidentally, my father uh, rented the cable television office building in Pulaski from my future father-in-law. Uh, so instead of marrying the farmer's daughter, I married the landlord's daughter. <laughs> Beth and I were introduced on, on a blind date by Ann Huey, who is in the audience uh, tonight, who uh, along with her husband, Jimmy, and our uh, mutual good friend, uh, Claudia Oakes. Uh, and uh, they are all native Giles Counties. They've known each other from literally day one. And uh, so uh, good friends are priceless, and appreciate you all coming this evening very much. Now, back to my, my path to Martin. So a good history teacher has to give you kind of background information on kind of a, kind of a buildup. You know, you just don't say, and the war started on such and such. Time. You've got to have background information. Summer 1964, I took a math class and a tennis class uh, from Harold Bass and uh, Kermit Smith, uh, respectively. That was my first real introduction uh, to life at Martin, and I was highly impressed uh, with my summer experience, uh, wishing then that it were a four-year uh, college. I remember going to President Westenberger's office uh, that summer, seeking his advice on a major that one day uh, might lead me to a career uh, here at Martin. I really liked the small size uh, and the friendly atmosphere, uh, coupled with the two of the best professors I have ever had, and that is still uh, true to this day. My career path uh, first took me to uh, Palatka, Florida, uh, for two years teaching history in a middle school and uh, then followed by three years uh, in Brownwood, Texas teaching history uh, in a high school. While in Brownwood I completed the master's degree in uh, 1971. Now let me back up just a little bit. In the meantime, Beth and I married in 1967 and uh, while I was teaching in Brownwood High School uh, full time and working uh, on my um, my master's degree, two children appeared, and I'm not for sure where. They just sort of appeared, you know, how that is. 
1970 and the other one 1971. And it's a good thing that we were young at that point in time. Uh, graduate school is, is always a challenge. Uh, so then begins uh, our family journey uh, then to Martin. Uh, the week following my uh, graduation uh, from uh, Howard Payne in August 1971, uh, we uh, moved uh, to Pulaski. Our oldest son, Patrick, who was about 17 months old at the time, contracted a terrible virus just before we left Texas. And of course, guess who caught it as soon as we arrived here? <laughs> <laughs> While recuperating home, our house was right across the street uh, from uh, the uh, from Melkerman Hall. Uh, while recuperating, recuperating home under the watchful care then of Nurse Beth, I could not help but notice uh, that the grass on the campus needed to be mowed uh, before classes started, started that fall, just a couple of days later. Very shaggy comes to mind. <laughs> a day or two before fall in-service started, I noticed that there were several faculty and staff persons out mowing and trimming the campus uh, with lawnmowers and tools uh, that they brought from home. I came to realize uh, that was not the first nor the last uh, of such activities. I'm quite sure in uh, 1971 it was strictly voluntary. But as time went on, voluntary came to be somewhat mandated. <laughs> as budgets got tighter and tighter, lots of stuff uh, got sliced from various line items, including faculty and staff positions, salaries, uh, programming, uh, all of that bit the dust. Uh, in the early years, Martin could, would hang on by a thread on the backs of uh, very loyal uh, faculty and staff. President Bill Starnes uh, put forth a Herculean effort uh, to raise money, but somehow there was never enough money uh, for the college uh, to breathe easy. Not even for a moment. Uh, Dr. Starnes had a will of iron, and if you know Dr. Starnes, if you knew him, you would know what I mean by will of iron. Uh, <laughs> He turned every stone looking for money. He, he, he did not give up. Uh, we all loved working here, loved the students, and did what was contractually expected of us, uh, plus uh, much, much more. As Dr. Vickers pointed out in September, the college suffered from a plague of uh, several fires and years of budget cuts and periodic uh, spurts of growth and decline uh, in enrollment. Uh, somehow the college escaped death numerous times, the last one being in 1978-79 uh, uh, when we were running out of ideas, uh, money, students, coupled with increasing competition coming from just up the road at Columbia State. In retrospect, Martin should have become a four-year college right after uh, World War II uh, of course, hindsight is uh, always uh, 2020. We were able to hold on until the 1990s when Martin uh, became a four-year institution. <clears throat> it's a problem of getting old. You can't remember exactly when it <laughs> happens around, you know, in, in the 1990s. I, I honestly don't remember the exact year that we became a four-year institution, somewhere about then. Uh, that was a, a very smart move for us to become a four-year institution. Back in the 1970s and 80s, it was felt that adding the word Methodist uh, to our name would bolster the enrollment. But initially, it only uh, uh, complicated things. Uh, we had to repeatedly clarify that you do not have to be a Methodist uh, to attend Martin. By the mid-1970s, I was uh, appointed uh, vice president then by, by Dr. Starnes. And soon to follow uh, was the title of uh, Dean of Admissions, uh, when the then Director of Admissions uh, uh, resigned and uh, left that position uh, vacant. So Dr. Starnes uh, combined the, the two together. <laughs> <clears throat> the President firmly believed that this was a budget balancing issue and it would not last too long. <laughs> Right, Robbie. <laughs> uh, 
I was able to assemble the, the best admissions staff imaginable. Uh, I really mean that. Uh, Anita Beecham, uh, Pam Keller, Swapna Shaw, uh, Kim Hammond, and yes, of course, the famous Robbie Shelton, <laughs> who later uh, became acting president and currently executive vice president for the college. Been here since 1988. Um, this successful admissions team also included Gail <coughs> Newton, who is also in the audience tonight. Gail's star was rising as she went uh, uh, on from the admissions office to become a business uh, faculty uh, professor, chair of the Division of Business, faculty senate chair, and director of uh, career services before her retirement uh, last year, 2019. Gail is a great friend of the college, and I'm proud to have worked with her uh, all of these years. The admissions staff worked tirelessly year after year, continually pulling rabbits out of hats. Uh, fortunately, we had enrollment increases every year uh, except for one. Uh, however, the college budget uh, was still lean. Uh, we had an abundance uh, of growing pains. Uh, while I was vice president and dean of admissions, I continued to, to teach history classes as uh, all faculty and staff uh, went beyond uh, their uh, contracts, what their contracts required. Many volunteering to help coach a team or sponsor clubs or honor societies, uh, uh, clean up the campus, uh, paint dorm rooms, tutor or counsel students uh, after class uh, or, or sit on endless committees. By the early 1990s, uh, our only full-time history professor accepted a teaching uh, position in Arkansas. And uh, I viewed her resignation as my best way uh, to return to the classroom uh, on a uh, full-time basis. And uh, at that point, I prou proudly handed all of my high blood pressure pills over to Robbie. <laughs> By this point in time, Robbie was very well trained uh, and highly capable of becoming uh, the new director of admissions. And uh, I'm proud to say that I hired Robbie, and uh, he has become like a third son to me. Martin is not for everyone, but it has been perfect uh, for uh, my family and me. Uh, I like the small college atmosphere located uh, in a small town. I'm very fortunate to have worked alongside many great people, both on the faculty and staff, as well as the administration, and uh, many uh, on the board of trustees as well. Sure, uh, as uh, in any relationship, there will be challenges uh, and potholes, uh, but there will also be periods of joy and a sense of accomplishment. Uh, the bottom line is the Martin faculty and staff always uh, puts the students first. Uh, those who understand the many benefits of a small college in a small town find peace and tranquility and a great sense uh, of accomplishment here. Won't you be my neighbor? Uh, rings true at Martin. Martin is not without its challenges. Uh, Dr. Vickers said in September, Martin is lucky to be alive following the fires and the economic uh, hard times that it faced. Uh, I am convinced uh, with the current uh, leadership of Dr. LaBranche and Dr. Cheatham that Martin's future is bright. Uh, in my estimation, all we need is a much larger endowment. Uh, the trustees, the president, the pro provost are, are not afraid uh, to tackle that issue. It will not be easy, but it is possible to generate a much larger endowment. Example. Chuck Pacinger, I think many of you know Chuck. Uh, he has said for many years that uh, he, he's been buying lottery tickets. Uh, and he said, if I win the big one, he said, I'm going to give it all to Martin. <laughs> <coughs> Dr. LeBranch, you might want to slip Chuck a $20 bill each week and, you know, just to see, let him continue to buy a few more tickets and to see, see what happens. It's hard to become more vile. Isn't it? <laughs> yes. <laughs> I learned a long time ago in my volunteer work with the Pulaski Main Street organization that one could not out Walmart Walmart. One must offer something unique and specialized uh, to be successful. Uh, Martin does that. We have an attractive campus, 
small class sizes, well-educated, uh, dedicated uh, faculty, devoted staff, a wide variety of majors, an MBA program, and plus other graduate programs uh, on the horizon, all here in Pulaski. Growth and expansion are expensive, uh, but uh, vital uh, for stability. And we must always have an eye uh, on the future. Growth requires a coordinated effort, including but not limited to a dynamic president and administration, a visionary provost, and intellectual and dedicated faculty and staff. A successful campus must have a diverse and a dedicated uh, student body uh, ready for the academic and the life challenges that uh, only a small college campus offers. All of that coupled with a forward-thinking uh, Board of Trustees uh, makes for a rich experience then uh, for all involved. Martin has all the ingredients. All we need to do is to double or triple the endowment. That's all we need to do. <laughs> Since uh, Chuck uh, has not stepped up with a winning lottery ticket yet, <laughs> does anyone have their checkbook with them tonight? <clears throat> and I'm sure Dr. LeBranch could arrange a meeting. <laughs> if I mention Dominic's name a, a few more times, uh, that would be a, a, a good start. So Dominic, 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 you know, you uh, appreciate his efforts in giving uh, money uh, to, uh, to the college. So uh, Dr. Cheatham, be, uh, you may have to remind him that he <laughs> said this. Okay, all right. So I think we can kind of round it up uh, a little bit and, you know, to, Dominic, 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 we rounded up to 10, so we'll try to get 10 more in before it's over. Small colleges create uh, lifelong friends. Um, I knew I would like Martin from the very first semester uh, beginning here in the fall of uh, 1971. Over the years, I have developed a close bond uh, with many students. For example, in the mid-1970s, there was a group of young women here that Gary Taylor and I called the Gulls, and G-U-L-L-S, the Gulls. They were exceptionally uh, bright, very eager to learn, anxious uh, to soak up culture, and oh, did I mention they all have a wonderful uh, sense of humor. Uh, this group is composed of Kim Murdoch, uh, Betsy Clendenin, Teresa Myatt, Mona Scott, Peggy Morgan, Luann Dunn, Sharon Harwell. Uh, would uh, and they would uh, most often on Sunday nights would come to our house uh, to watch Masterpiece Theater and to eat popcorn. <coughs> we had a great time. That, there were only two televisions on campus at that point in time, one in the lobby of uh, the girls' uh, dorm and one in the lobby of the boys' dorm. And that was it. None of the students uh, had televisions in their rooms. Um, so uh, they... They, uh, they were probably just looking to, uh, for a way to get out of the dormitory and eat some popcorn or something, but nonetheless, uh, they, they came to our house and we had more fun, uh, you know, with, with that group of gulls. We still see the gulls uh, about uh, once a year, uh, and it, it is it, as if they never graduated. <laughs> you know? <laughs> Wonderful. Gary, Beth, and I instilled in them and countless other students, the importance of exploring the world and developing a sense of culture and humanity, as well as learning to appreciate our uh, fellow citizens uh, on uh, planet Earth. We learned a lot from them as well. Uh, their kindness, energy, generosity, intellectual enthusiasm, uh, all of that was infectious. I have countless uh, close friends that were former colleagues and our students from all around the world, and my life has been uh, much richer as a result of our crossing paths uh, at Martin. Another good friend of mine from that same time period uh, as the girls was DeWitt Booth, who is in the back, I'm back here tonight. Um, DeWitt uh, and I always enjoy uh, good stories from the old days uh, yeah, here at Martin. And DeWitt, for sure, is uh, one of our shining stars. I appreciate you being here tonight, DeWitt. Uh, I'm also a proud member of a strange little group of uh, personalities, I guess you could call them, um, <clears throat> all with a Martin connection called the Sanity Club. <laughs> Believe me, there's not much in the way of sanity 
that occurs in our uh, quarterly uh, lunch meetings. Uh, this esteemed uh, group is composed of Gary Taylor and Bob Lewis, uh, Jim Hughes, uh, Overton Campbell, uh, Betty uh, Ford Mayer, and Bill Mott. Most all of those were former students uh, and or faculty staff members uh, here at Martin. We sadly we have lost uh, two of our members, Ben Alford uh, and, uh, and Fred Ford. The Sanity Club uh, brings all of us uh, together and brings some relief from the stresses of the world. And without exception, we always uh, recount several funny stories uh, from, the, from the old days at Martin. I hope the Sanity Club uh, will uh, last forever. Most faculty and staff persons have uh, developed close bonds with, uh, with former students and colleagues, and so I am I'm not uh, unique in that regard at all. From my very first faculty meeting in 1971, uh, I sensed that a, a common bond existed with uh, most of the uh, uh, faculty and staff. Notice I said most. <laughs> We've never all agreed on issues. We have a mutual respect for each other, uh, sometimes agreeing, sometimes agreeing to disagree, especially on campus issues and on uh, national politics. Our relationships are, are very much like uh, sibling rivalries. Uh, I dare not start listing individual names or I might be here all night, uh, thus breaking the 5B rule. <laughs> I will mention uh, just a few who have stood out in my mind uh, over the years. And if you've been in and around Pulaski or Martin for any length of time, most of these names will, will be familiar uh, uh, to you in one way or another. Uh, like Lois Keyes, Tom Reed, uh, Royce Hughes, Grant uh, Vosberg, uh, Ted Brown, Kermit Smith, Ms. Woodard, and for the life of me, I cannot remember Ms. Woodard's first name. Anybody, because she was the dorm director in um, um, the ladies' dorm, women's dormitory. Wonderful lady, wonderful, wonderful sense of humor. But her first name escapes me. I'm just wild about her. Maurice Roberts, who was academic uh, dean here for a while, who was described, <laughs> by, and if you knew, knew Maurice, uh, you know what I'm talking about, described by one of his neighbors as that man cannot be Dean at Martin. He's crazy. <laughs> <laughs> the neighbor was right on target. <laughs> but what a character. Nidra Trebbing, Lois Shelton, Joe Smith, Bill Burks, James Smith. Now, I'll, I'll have more to say about James uh, uh, here in a little bit. Uh, and Albert Hughes, uh, gee whiz, Albert, the uh, music professor here and uh, had uh, a great sense of humor, choir director. And he <laughs> took, the, uh, took the choir out uh, one Sunday morning to a, a small Methodist church uh, somewhere, you know, like they, they often did. And uh, so one of the uh, members of the congregation came up after, afterwards and said, oh, what a great performance, really enjoyed your music, thank you for coming and all that. He says, I'm going to send some money to, uh, to, the, to the college. So Albert assumed that, uh, you know, he's going to get a check from the, from the man uh, for the uh, music program, only to discover that the man did send a $100 check in, but it was for the baseball team. So, uh, <laughs> Albert laughed and laughed and laughed about that story. Marcus Nichols, and there's, there's another uh, story that we could take all night uh, to, to tell there. Paula Stevenson. Lucille Johnson, uh, in the olden days, we had a switchboard which was larger than this podium I'm standing behind with all those little cords that would be plugging in out like this. And uh, it was wonderful. She, she was like uh, a live uh, answering machine. Uh, <laughs> Lucille knew where everybody was. Not She wasn't being nosy, nosy or anything, but she knew everybody, where they were, when they'd be back, the whole nine yards. If you didn't know where someone was, you just call the switchboard, and Lucille, do you know where so-and-so is? Yes, 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 he'll be back in 30 minutes or whatever. <clears throat> <clears throat> <clears throat> <clears throat> <clears throat> 
Beth and I and the kids were about, I guess, mid-1970s on a vacation driving to New Mexico. Now, if you haven't driven to New Mexico, two little kids, don't. Um, <laughs> so we'd look for every opportunity to get out of the car. So uh, we were in Pecos, Texas. Us and a few jackrabbits and rattlesnakes and a few other critters. We get out of the car to go into Judge Roy Bean's museum. Judge Roy Bean, west of the Pecos Museum, which is a, not quite as large as half of this auditorium. Um, it's not one of the major museums in the world. Lo and behold, we go into the museum, and there was a switchboard just like the one we were still using at Martin. <laughs> I came back and told James, and I told Lucille, I know where we can get parts <laughs> for hours. I miss Lucille ever so much because she, she was so very efficient at, uh, at, her, at her job, and she was uh, a she, she, very, very interesting lady, uh, for sure. Wayne Price, uh, Glenna Burton, uh, Jerry Hibden, uh, Jerry D, golly, uh, I miss Jerry. Bill McKinney, uh, all of those folks are now deceased. And uh, I will miss all of them, miss them very much. And uh, what, a, what a cast of characters uh, they were. And it would make a wonderful study of some sort. I'm not, <laughs> not for sure what. Now, <clears throat> very much alive, or... Uh, Anita Beecham, uh, Chuck Pacinger, Mary Lou Moore, Harold Bance, Jane Dawson, uh, Pat Whittemore, who's here this evening, Gail Newton, also here, Johnny Jackson, Steve West, and Ralph Johnson, all a part of uh, the expanding um, neighborhood of retired persons here at Martin. Anita and I started to work at Martin uh, in uh, 1971. In fact, she has me beat by two months. She came to work in June, and I didn't come until uh, August. She's still going strong uh, in the uh, financial aid office. But I'd also like to mention my uh, longtime friendship with uh, Rhonda Kleinard over in the uh, business office, who is here this evening also, Sherry Yokely, uh, Gordon Thayer, uh, Grace Meyer, uh, Brand Harwell, who I'll have more to say about in a minute. <laughs> Pat Ford, uh, Stanton Belford in the back. Thank you, Stanton. Jamie Hub, Emma Hub, uh, Cedric and Kulu and Landon Calvert. They 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 are going to be have front row seats in heaven. I guarantee you, the two of them uh, for putting up with me in the IT office. And uh, if you if you know me at all, you know I'm somewhat limited when it comes to uh, technology. And uh, so I, I wonder why they turned off the lights and locked the door when they see me coming, but I don't know. Also, I'd like to include Laura McMasters, uh, Richard Madden, who's here this evening, our librarian, Dennis Haskins, uh, and my, my cousin, uh, Diane Bass, uh, who, was, who was here. Diane, uh, her maiden name uh, was Rutherford. I, we have decided we are somehow cousins. We're not exactly for sure how, but I'm very proud to call her Cousin Diane. Uh, Dan Trotter, uh, Johnny Jones, uh, Jim Merle, Edna Luna, uh, Mimi Blanco. <laughs> There's a low, lot of good stories about Mimi. Uh, Guy Schaefer, who is in charge of uh, uh, videotaping this evening. Uh, Joe Harden, uh, Jess Dicus, Lou Foster, and George Cheatham. Um, did I mention Dominic Negrelli? Um, <laughs> I don't think I mentioned Dominic. Yeah. yeah. So there's a little bit more uh, toward that uh, goal that uh, Dominic uh, had uh, of a thousand dollars. I'm honored to have uh, been a member uh, of the founding team of the Della Clayton Lee uh, concert series, uh, led by the great visionary minds of uh, Ben Alford uh, and Gary Taylor two of the most loyal friends of the college. Uh, both men brilliant and uh, creative uh, beyond measure. And the series started in the early 1970s and uh, is still uh, going strong today. 
And Linda Rogers uh, is here this evening. Um, it's her, uh, Della was her grandmother, and not a sweeter person on earth uh, than, than Della Clayton Lay. She just, just marvelous. I'm honored to have uh, served on the, uh, the faculty senate, uh, along with notables like Johnny Jackson, Pat Whittemore, and Gail Newton. Uh, we each took turns serving as chairperson of this esteemed group. No, you take it this year. No, you take it. <laughs> <laughs> Sharing in many of the responsibilities then associated uh, uh, with uh, the Senate. Some of our challenges uh, were really beyond description, uh, but we were dedicated to the advancement of the faculty uh, as well as the college. There were no better committee to work with than Johnny, Pat, and Gail. Uh, they too will be on my best friends list uh, forever. And I would like to add uh, this thought uh, about Johnny Jackson. Um, when Often when passing Johnny's uh, office, there would be a student or two in there seeking a bit of math tutoring uh, from him. If Johnny had been paid by the hour, uh, he would be a wealthy man uh, now. <laughs> Johnny, along with Pat Whittemore and <clears throat> Gail Newton, are the embodiment of what makes Martin a stellar place to teach, uh, to study, uh, and to grow. Uh, all three are experts uh, in their fields extremely professional and dedicated uh, and loyal uh, to the college. I'm honored to uh, have served on the administrative staff with luminaries uh, like Carol Bass and Ben Alford, uh, Fred Ford, uh, and Gary Taylor. Uh, they made staff meetings electric uh, with their never ending flow of great ideas uh, and solutions. Uh, each problem was taken to heart and uh, dealt with individually. When my good friend uh, Jane Dawson retired, I was asked to become uh, the division chair then uh, for the social sciences. Jane had created a very well-oiled system uh, for, the, for the structure and uh, organization uh, of our uh, division, thus making my job a relative breeze. All I had to do uh, was to uh, follow her lead. Uh, additionally, uh, we had top-notch folks uh, in our division all uh, totally dedicated uh, and professional. I was pleased to assist uh, John Lancaster with the expansion of the human services and psychology programs, as well as assisting John White uh, with the establishment of the uh, uh, criminal uh, justice program. Being a history teacher at heart, I was proud to establish the new four-year uh, history program and to bring Ken Vickers and uh, Scott Howellman uh, on board to manage uh, to fine tune and to expand our new history major. Uh, I will add uh, they are doing a fantastic job and I am very proud uh, of their work. Doris Watson Fisher, over here in the uh, second row, was my go to person in our division uh, when there were issues between students, uh, faculty, or administration, as she was a counselor uh, in her former life. <laughs> if she had charged a fee. I'm sure I would owe her more than $10,000. <laughs> About uh, 20 years ago, uh, President Brown and Dr. Jim Merle asked me to organize and to establish uh, the honors program. Uh, I uh, gladly accepted the challenge and uh, set out to accomplish uh, that task. We created a campus brainstorming committee examined and visited uh, several um, honors programs in area colleges and organized a massive uh, fundraising effort, um, especially earmarked uh, then for the uh, honors program. <laughs> Believe me, uh, it was no uh, small task, and it would never have gotten off the ground with the ac without the expertise and hard work of uh, Kim Harrison, uh, Sally Phelps, and uh, Chrissy Jordan. Uh, they were a great team. I uh, always enjoy working with them. There's always going to be laughter when you're with that crowd. I'm honored to have been the director then of the W. Gary Taylor Honors Program for a decade. Brand Harwell followed me in the next, as the next director of the program here on the front row. Uh, he led the program to imaginative uh, new heights with a greater emphasis on international learning experiences as well as developing creative ways to introduce students uh, to new 
uh, cultural uh, and academic experiences. Grant was the director for almost a decade before turning the reins over then to Ken Vickers uh, this past year. I'm confident that the honors program will continue to grow, develop, and evolve to new heights uh, under Ken's uh, effective leadership. I was indeed honored to be a part of the creative uh, team that established uh, the uh, Joe uh, W. Henry uh, Law Lecture Series. I mentioned the uh, concept uh, to John White and uh, President Brown, and before you knew it, uh, we were having lunch with Joe and Bob. And Joe and Bob liked the idea, and uh, so John White and I went to work, and as, to say, as they say, the rest is history. With the vast connections uh, of the Henry family, all John White and I had to do was to get out of the way and decide on menu options, like whether to have baked or fried chicken, you know. <clears throat> the Henry Law Lectures are still a part of the college's annual programming and remain quite popular uh, with audiences. Dr. LeBranch and Dr. Judy Cheatham are taking great interest in this series and will continue to work with Joe and Bob uh, to bring outstanding figures then from the legal world to our campus uh, to honor the legacy of uh, Chief Justice uh, Joe W. Henry Sr. I was very pleased to be a part of the Committee for the Business, uh, Business Ethics uh, Symposium. And this uh, series of programs introduced a business perspective uh, to such topics uh, as social responsibility, uh, the environment, as well as the encouragement of lifelong learning uh, opportunities uh, to keep employees engaged not only in the workplace, but also in the global society uh, in, in which we all live. Uh, now, I'm going to emphasize this sentence. I strongly encourage the college to revisit the possibility of reinstituting uh, the Business Ethics Symposium. This series of lectures provided many opportunities for students to meet business leaders as well as being active participants in the planning and uh, implementation then uh, of this series. I enjoyed working with Gail Newton and Ted Brown and several trustees as the Business Ethics uh, Symposium unfolded. Unfortunately, the symposium fell victim to a budget cut, and uh, so it, it, it sort of um, uh, got, got swept away. But it, it truly, truly was a, a, a great uh, event, uh, not only for the audience, but for, but for our students who could participate in that business ethics symposium. So I really do encourage the college to revisit that. Gail might be willing to share an idea or two with the college, but, uh, uh, you know, she is retired now, so, <clears throat> but she could probably tell you uh, how to get it structured and organized again. One of my uh, highlights uh, uh, here at Martin is, was working with uh, a student from the class of 2012, uh, Michael Boyer. Uh, he led Martin's Tennessee uh, intercollegiate student legislature team to statewide victory, not only over Vanderbilt, uh, Dr. Rickers, but also over Rhodes College. Now, I know, Claudia, <laughs> <laughs> Claudia happens to be a graduate of Rhodes College, but, you know, I just had to, you know, mention that. <laughs> that our Martin team beat both Vanderbilt and Rhodes. I was extremely proud of their efforts uh, put uh, forward by not only Michael, but three of his uh, fellow students as they generated lots of positive uh, excitement about the academic movement here at the college. Being a small college, not only do the faculty and staff and students work together, but also uh, that idea extends to the Board of Trustees. It is my honor to have worked side by side on many committees with various trustees uh, over the years. Our trustees demonstrated a passion for the college and a willingness uh, to go, go beyond the call of duty. I finally recall working closely with trustees like Della Clayton Lee, Philip Ritter, uh, Robert Smith, Bill Murray, Morris Ed Harwell, Robert E. Curry, Mike Curry, Ted Lippman, Herschel Lake, Stacy Garner, 
Byron Trauger, and most especially uh, Joe Henry. Joe was uh, chair of the uh, faculty uh, committee of the Board of Trustees for, for many years. He worked uh, tirelessly in behalf of the college, always presenting a strong uh, voice uh, for the faculty. The college is in great hands as uh, we are at this uh, sesquicentennial uh, milestone. When the uh, sesquicentennial committee invited me to speak tonight, one of the members asked me, in, in my estimation, who is the most important person in the history of the college for the past 50 years? There have been countless uh, great uh, people who have worked uh, or studied at Martin uh, over, over that period of time. I have limited time this evening, so I, I was able to only mention just a few who, were, who stood out in my mind uh, over the, the past 50 years. If I chose the person uh, who best personifies Martin's mission, it would be James Smith, the Director of Maintenance from uh, 1950 until uh, 1987. James knew where every pipe was buried, every electric wire located, how to keep up with, keep the, all, all the old boilers working, working for years to patch leaking roofs, repair motors, engines, replace belts on lawnmowers, manage a crew, etc., etc., etc. In a word, James was a genius. His abilities went far beyond his amazing technical knowledge. Uh, he was a good-hearted man, husband, and father. I never saw him get angry. He was uh, super responsible about keeping the campus running efficiently and totally dedicated and loyal uh, to the college. James grew up in Jim Crow South and faced lots of racial issues uh, over the years of that, I am sure. Regardless of the time of day or night, weekends or holidays, James was just a phone call away when uh, maintenance issues uh, happened on campus. I feel certain the, the college took advantage of James's multitude of skills, plus his good nature as a man, and as he was repeatedly called to the campus to repair aging, uh, plumbing, electricity, roofs, lawnmowers, whatever. James never said no, and it would always be able to fulfill any task, uh, always with a smile. James often drove uh, the college bus, uh, taking athletes to games and choirs uh, to sing at churches. Uh, many trips took them through the rural south in the dark days of uh, segregation. James had many stories about those trips. He was complimentary uh, of the coaches, uh, the players, and the choirs for being by his side as they uh, traversed uh, the back roads uh, and the highways of uh, the rural south. I'm proud to call James my friend, and we could refer to him as our Mr. Rogers. The Martin neighborhood is much better uh, because of James. I'm also quite sure he was never paid anywhere near uh, what he was worth uh, to the college. When James retired in, from the college, uh, the, we began to contract our maintenance uh, um, uh, issues out to various companies, outside companies, and the new crews didn't know where to start. James was truly a jewel uh, in the crown of the college. His son, J.B. Smith, is here this evening. J.B., would you please stand and let us welcome you, please? <laughs> I was so very proud to know your father. He's a great, great man. Martin has uh, provided me uh, opportunities that I most likely would not have been offered at other colleges. Uh, Beth, who is native to Pulaski, and I are proud to have uh, reared our two sons here uh, in the shadow of the campus. Our kids enjoyed uh, playing on the green and uh, interacting uh, with uh, college students. It was like one big extended family, or maybe I should say neighborhood. Beth and I, uh, along with uh, Gary Taylor, sponsored several travel opportunities uh, to Europe uh, for the students and friends of the college. I often see former uh, students uh, who travel with us and fond fondly remember 
uh, those experiences. Bud Alexander is one of those uh, persons who traveled with us. He's here this evening. Bud is a recently retired United Methodist minister. We uh, went that particular trip to London and uh, Paris, and we were in, in Paris. And uh, Gary and I and Beth uh, told students, get a little pocket dictionary whenever you're in a foreign country. And, flip through it and, you know, ask at least where's the bathroom or something in, uh, in that whatever language uh, that we happen to be, whatever country we happen to be in. So we all did. We all had our little dictionaries. Unfortunately, we had been at the Louvre or someplace all day long. We got back to the hotel, changed clothes quickly, and went to a restaurant a couple of doors down from the hotel without our French dictionaries, unfortunately. So... Someone back home had told Bud to be sure to order duck when you go to Paris, that the French really know how to prepare duck. So he was had his teeth set for duck uh, that evening. So we get into the restaurant. Of course, it was a very large menu, and it was all in French. And none of us could remember what duck was <laughs> in French. So it was, uh, you know, looking back. Bud in all innocence, looked up at the waitress, put his hands under his arm like this, and went quack, 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 quack. <laughs> Bud got his duck. <laughs> and we all had a good laugh, uh, as a result, including the waitress. She was, she was thrilled. <laughs> I don't know if you can remember um, uh, that scene or not, Bud, but I could, it was like it was yesterday. We remember it very well. <laughs> the only regret I have uh, about the past 50 years is the fact that I did not have the opportunity uh, to complete my doctorate. Uh, sometimes life, responsibilities, and distance uh, get in the way of progress. Overall, it's been a wonderful experience. Uh, currently, I am completing my 49th year here at Martin. I plan to uh, completely retire after my 50th year. I've uh, worked alongside nine of Martin's 31 presidents, uh, all very different in personality, but all equally dedicated uh, to the purposes and principles uh, of the college. Johnny Jackson, I need uh, your math skills uh, here, um, please. If uh, the college is 150 years old and I'm 75 years old, does that make me uh, one half of the age of the college when the train left Chicago? <laughs> We're always teasing Johnny about those junior high math questions, which always started off or ended with the phrase, when the train left Chicago. In addition, I have been teaching here for 50 years. Does that mean I have been at Martin for one-third of its life? Uh, the important question is, does that make me old? And secondly, where was that train going when it left Chicago? <laughs> I cannot uh, tell you everything that uh, happened here in the past 50 years, but I encourage uh, people like Steve West and Kayla Wiggins and others uh, to write about this time period. Uh, in history, you have to do that. You sort of have to take segments of time and kind of deal with the segment of time. You can't deal with the history of whatever uh, from beginning to end. It usually doesn't work. So, you take a take a time period, and this 50-year time period would be great because of all the uh, wonderful personalities and and events and activities that occurred here at the college. Steve has a wonderful way of expressing himself in poetry, and uh, Kayla has a real gift uh, for writing stories. And perhaps they could generate a collection of poems or short stories, a play or a novel or something. Uh, their publications would need to be sold as fiction, however, as no one would believe uh, some of the stuff uh, that would be, uh, uh, you know, in, in their publications. I would be glad to sit down uh, with, with them or anyone else and share some uh, interesting uh, food for thought, and uh, uh, that would be a good retirement project uh, for, for both of them. I'm sure that Jane and Pat and Gail and Johnny, others, would have a lot to contribute to, to this publication. It might be several volumes thick. However, uh, we want a percentage of the royalties, don't you think? <laughs> Your works uh, would be bestsellers, especially considering 
uh, the diversity uh, of the authors. Instead of Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood, perhaps we could call it Mr. Martin's College. I'm glad to be your, I'm, I'm glad you're my neighbor. Thank you for coming tonight. There are uh, plenty more stories and personalities uh, from the past 50 years uh, for additional programming as uh, I've just literally scratched the surface. And thank you all again for coming. I appreciate it. Bill, and um, I was thinking about how important it is for institutions like this to have pillars uh, who are steadfast. I was thinking about that hymn, uh, true-hearted, wholehearted, faithful and loyal people who remain pillars so that when the wind blows and the earth shakes, <laughs> uh, they're there to... Uh, maintain the institution but I think what really helped during that time you know earthquakes uh, unless there's some movement built in uh, uh, the building will come down regardless of its pillars and I think the equanimity and sense of humor that this man and the rest of the staff and faculty have been here many years has not only sustained them but sustained this institution yeah. so thank you very much thank you very much appreciate it thank you so much